This is HEC Media. Welcome to Talking with Authors. I'm your host, Rod Milam. Throughout all of our podcasts, we'll be speaking with a variety of best selling authors spanning many genres authors like Judy Bloom, Janet Napolitano, and so many more. HEC Media is a production company out of St. Louis, Missouri, and with the help of independent bookstore Left Bank Books and the St. Louis County Library, we are able to sit down with an amazing group of writers and thought leaders to discuss their work, their inspiration, and what makes them special. Also, you can watch video versions of most of these interviews by going to hecmedia.org. Today, our author is New York Times bestselling writer Brad Meltzer. We spoke with him in January of 2019 as part of a book tour he was on for his then latest work, The First Conspiracy, The Secret Plot to Kill George Washington. Our conversation took place on the campus of Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Brad Meltzer is a writer of many genres, from children's books and comics to television and political thrillers. But this book that he'll discuss at length today, The First Conspiracy, is his first foray into nonfiction. Here, he heads back to the time period before the end of the Revolutionary War and through the early days of the United States, where George Washington had to set up an entire operation to counter a probable attempt against his life. Well, one of the things that George Washington did is he started a secret committee to look at this plot. And the breakthrough came when we found the transcripts of the secret committee's tribunal. George Washington barely says a word about it. On the day that he hanged the man in front of 20,000 people, barely mentions it. If I murdered someone in front of 20,000 people, I'd be like, Dear Diary, had a bad day. We'll hear more about that and other items he uncovered in his research for that book, plus a wide-ranging discussion about his in-person contact with other former U.S. presidents, his connection to 9-11, and his I Am series of children's books on this episode of Talking with Authors from HEC Media and HEC Books. Here's Brad Meltzer with our host, HEC's Angie Weidinger. Well, we are in the Olin Library which on Washington University's campus, which is fitting. I mean, there's a statue of George Washington outside this building. I felt like I had to come here no matter what, just right. to keep the theme of the book going. Right. And then, I don't know if you saw, across the hall from where we are, there is a, it's the Southwick broadside of the Declaration of Independence. Oh, there it is? It's yeah. here? Oh, I'm yeah. going to see it. <laughs> to go afterwards. Oh, it's right here, right outside? Right across the hall. Oh, I'll be there. If it's missing, it wasn't me. <laughs> No, we're happy to have you here in, in a very fitting place to talk about your book, The First Conspiracy, which, you know, something like that happened in 1776. You think, boy, everything we know about the Declaration of Independence, the Revolutionary War, you think by now we've learned it all. We've heard it all. No. Yeah, there's no, and there's always a good news story. That's the best part of history. And that's how it was for me with this book. I found this story nearly a decade ago and in the footnotes of all places because that's where all the great secrets hide. <laughs> and I saw those words, it said something like, a secret plot to kill George Washington. And I was like, is that real? Is that nonsense on the internet? What is it? And it was real. In 1776, there was a secret plot to kill George Washington. When George Washington found out about it, he rounded up those responsible, built a gallows, grabbed one of the main co-conspirators, and he hanged him in front of 20,000 people the largest public execution at that point in North American history just brought the hammer down. I was like, I'm George Washington. Um, but I love the story. And I said, I need to tell this story. I was so obsessed with it. So what I found interesting in reading your book was that when you started on this journey, you had authors saying, this is going to be a hard one. I don't know if you want to, because it, a lot of it was secret. Yeah. I mean, even though there were 20,000 people what, witnessing this. Right. It's not something that we've really read about in anything that's modern. And I went to Pulitzer Prize winning author Joseph Ellis, and who wrote one of the great Washington biographies. And I said to him, do you know this story? What do you think? And he said, this is a story about Washington's spies. And he said, right now you can find exactly how many slaves George Washington owned. You'll never find all his spies. He said, by its nature, what you're going to be searching for, Brad, will forever be elusive. And he said, but you gotta try, because if it works, you get a book out of it. If not, you have an adventure. And I love having an adventure. So I had to go try this. And the first thing I did is I called uh, the executive producer from our television show, is documentarian Josh Mensch. And he and I, working with the History Channel, found the 9-11 flag that the firefighters raised to ground zero. And I just said, you ready to go down the rabbit hole? Because I wanna go take a look at George Washington. And so at any point during that, did you say, you know what, this has been a great adventure? 
I, I don't think we got a book here. Or, or was there a moment when you said, ah, we have a book? Like, you, was there a piece of information that you're like, okay? Yeah, the one, you? in the beginning, I was like, I don't know if we're going to find anything because it was something that I'd never heard about and it was clearly so kind of buried. And the key breakthrough for me is when we found, well, one of the things that George Washington did is he started a secret committee and to look at this plot. And he put John Jay in charge of it, who became the first Supreme Court Justice. But at this time, he's just working for George Washington in this small committee. And they're knocking on doors, they're pulling people out of their houses in the middle of the night, they're checking suspects and interrogating them. But what they're really doing in the process is they're building America's first counterintelligence agency. And to this day, in Virginia, in Langley, at CIA headquarters, there's a room dedicated to John Jay, the founding father, they call him, of counterintelligence. And the breakthrough came when we found the transcripts of the Secret Committee's tribunal. And this was the key moment, right? Because George Washington doesn't write about it. He barely says a word about it. On the day that he hanged the man in front of 20,000 people, barely mentions it. If I murdered someone in front of 20,000 people, I'd be like, dear diary, had a bad day, <laughs> right? George Washington plays his cards so close to the vest, barely says a word. But John Jay and the Secret Committee, when they had this, when they tried this man, there were witnesses called, there were people brought to testify, sworn under oath, and thankfully, there was someone writing a full transcript. And when we got that, I was like, okay, the whole thing kind of cracked open. And that information you found where? Um, it was, at, you know, the funny thing is, is it's not in the regular court system because it was a quiet one. So it was in the New York Provincial Congress records. And I love to imagine us as like, you know, I'm Indiana Jones and I crawl through the cobwebs and then I, I unearth this arcane information and present it in this book. Right. But the reality is the information's online. You can find much of it in all these places. It's just that no one wants to read it. We just took the time to actually read it. And there's great stories out there. Oh, it's so interesting. It's a, it's a great book in that you know what happens, obviously. We all know what happened with history, but y you read it with anticipation of wondering how it all happens. Right? And, you know, and there's things you just never would ever know. Like one of the things that I loved is finding out that George Washington had his own personal bodyguards and that he went to all of his top officers and he said, give me your four best men. He wanted what they call drilled men, the best of the absolute best. And one of the things he did is he personally, George Washington himself, narrowed down to about 50 men. Like these were the inner circle. These were the ones he trusted the best of the very best. And they were called the general's guard. They were called the commander's guard. But the name that stuck, were well, they called them the lifeguards. Because one of the things they watched was George Washington's life. They were literally the guards of his life. And these were the men who turned on George Washington. And I don't care how strong a general you are. I don't care that you're the first president. That's a moment that's devastating for George Washington. And, and none of us know that story. And you better believe I was like, this is going in the book too. What I found so interesting as well is that it really makes you realize, you know, when you learn about history in school, it's like the Revolutionary War, yeah, it was tough, but we won. But this takes it to the nth level where you realize, oh my gosh, all the obstacles that George Washington had to kind of surmount to get to where we could win a war against this powerhouse, Great Britain. Yeah, and what we do with our heroes today is we dip them in granite, we build statues of them, right? And we do them no good service when we do that. Um, we, we forget that they're human beings. And anyone you look up to, whether it's George Washington, whether it's Rosa Parks, whether it's Dr. King, whether it's someone in your own family, you say, that's my hero. They had moments where they were scared and they were terrified. They had moments where they didn't think they could go on, but they kept going. And it's the same with George Washington. When you look at this, we tell the story that George Washington, we, you know, we all held hands, we dreamed of democracy, we beat the British, and took down the greatest fighting force that ever lived. The end, happily ever after. Right. Great story. It's not the real story. Um, if you think we're divided today as a country, back then in 1776, there were nearly as many loyalists on the British side in New York City as there were patriots on the American side. And it was the same in our own military. You can see that the Massachusetts Regiment was fighting with the Virginia Regiment. There's a scene where they get in this big argument in Harvard Yard because that's where they're meeting up in Massachusetts. And George Washington comes racing in. The big fight's going on, jumps off his horse, grabs two of the guys, and he's shaking him, basically saying, why are you fighting with each other? We're on the same team. If ever there were a metaphor for where we are today, this is it. And there was no United States back then. George Washington helped build it by putting his arms around this thing and, and, and pulling everyone together. And victory was not a foregone conclusion. We almost lost over and over again. It's interesting because everything you say, I mean, it sounds like he just gets bigger and bigger and greater and greater, you know, in my mind. And it, 
you know, while there were things of the time, slavery and things like that, there were things about him that just he keeps raising to, to new levels, doesn't he? The he more does. Well, that's the thing. I mean, he's just, you know, all heroes at the end of the day are mirrors. And we hold them up and we see what we want to see. And every once in a while you get those heroes who aren't mirrors. They're actually just amazing on their own. Uh, George Washington is the perfect one. You know, he's, he's on the money. We see him every single day on the dollar bill. We arguably is the most recognizable American of all time. But just as oddly, we know the least about him as a person. And He's not like John Adams. He's not like Jefferson, who are writing these flowing love letters to their loved ones saying what all their emotions are. Well, again, Washington is silent. But one of the things you can see is in his actions. So there's a scene that I love at the Battle of Brooklyn in the book. It's one of the first great battles of the Revolutionary War when the British finally invade New York. And we don't win. We get our butt kicked. George Washington gets out generaled. He doesn't have the experience of these British generals. And he's pinned down. He's got the British in front of him, the East River behind them. There's nowhere to run. This, is be the, this should be the moment where George Washington dies. It should be all over. And instead, George Washington does the best thing he always does. He adapts. He improvises. He plans a daring escape in the middle of the night. He, they commandeer every boat that's along the East River. And slowly, one by one, he puts his men aboard this boat. But here is the key moment, is George Washington won't get in any of the boats until he makes sure that all of his men, even the lowest ranking ones, are in those boats first. And they see that he's risking his life for theirs. And that's what leadership is. Leadership isn't about being in charge. It's about taking care of those in your charge. And those are the kinds of leaders we need today. Those ones that pull us together, um, like George Washington, with humility, not with you know screaming and yelling and pointing to themselves. Is that, remember when humility was a great American value? To me, with George Washington, that's what we have to demand to get back again. Coming up in a moment, we'll hear how Brad Meltzer shared his work about the first president with the 41st president. When we know that President Bush is really sick, I know what's coming. But to be able to read about the first president to, at that point, the oldest living president was humbling. And about his own personal mantra and how he tries to teach his own children how to live. Dream big, work hard, stay humble. If you, if you met my kids right today yeah. and you said, dream big, they would go, work hard, stay humble. I mean, they've heard that every single night, even when I left for tour to come here. That's the last thing I said to them. All of that, plus his connection to preserving the history surrounding 9-11, when Talking With Authors continues from HEC Media. Educate Today offers an ever-growing library of the highest quality video resources, curriculum materials, and interactive programs all of which are designed to challenge thinking, inspire creativity, and empower learning of students, educators, parents, and lifelong learners. And you can find out more about all these programs by going online to educate.today. That's educate.today. You, you talk about leaders and what we have, and one of the leaders that, that you became quite close with was George H.W. Bush. And this book, you actually had the occasion to read it to him, is that right? Yeah, uh, so I got a, a fan letter uh, years ago from President George H.W. Bush. I got another one from Bill Clinton. I thought they were totally fake because when I was 18 years old, and just had a, I was in college, my first job was at the Senate Judiciary Committee. And we used to use the pen signing machines for the senators and the stationery from Judiciary Committee. I'd write to my friends and tell them they were being <laughs> deported, right? So I thought this whole thing was fake. I was like, this is totally fake. They're getting me back. And they said, oh, you got the president's letter. And we became really dear friends. I went and we did a lot of work of, with literacy with the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy. And when she passed away, we wanted to honor her work with literacy because she believed you have to teach everyone to read. You teach not just kids, but adults, immigrants, people who can't speak English. That's how you unlock the American dream. So we were honoring in Kennebunkport, Maine, a few months back, honoring Mrs. Bush. And at this point, we know that President Bush is really sick. I know what's coming. I know he's going to die. And they said to me that they were bringing in some of his favorite authors to read to him. So they said, would you like to read to him? I said, I'd be honored, of course. And we go to Kennebunkport to his house. Um, and then he has, obviously, an office that's connected to it a couple doors down. And this is it, right? It's my, it's my wife and myself. It's President Bush and his service dog, Sully. Secret Service leave. And we know this is the end. On his desk is about five or six books stacked up. I see one of them is the first conspiracy. He's got our book there. And 
you know, it's, it looks like it's dog-eared. He had given it a blurb. He had, I sent it to him almost a year ago, but it looks like it's been read over and over. And I take my copy and I say, sir, you want to read this? And he's like, mm-hmm, because he couldn't really speak at that point. He could nod and kind of, mm-hmm. And I brought him and I opened to one of my favorite scenes in the book where George Washington, for the first time, has the Declaration of Independence presented to the troops. And I'm reading to him. They say he's going to be sleeping in 10 minutes. That's just the way it's going to be. And sure enough, 10 minutes in, he's sleeping. But I get to those words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And his eyes open and he locks on me. President Bush is just pure clarity, just locked on me. And it's like the words of the Declaration of Independence are lifeblood, right? The ultimate IV for a U.S. president. According to George Washington's orders, one of his officers, which one exactly is not known, stands on an elevated platform and holds the special document the commander-in-chief has given him to read. With thousands of troops and other onlookers listening, with George Washington himself standing nearby, and with the British warships not far away in the harbor, the officer begins to read. Of course, today we've all heard the phrases countless times, but on this night in 1776, the vast majority of these officers and soldiers hear the words for the very first time. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are the words. These words are why they are fighting. These words are worth not just fighting for, but dying for. The reading continues even as the light begins to fade. Soon the officer gets to the final sentence. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. By every account from witnesses and participants in this extraordinary gathering, when those final words are spoken, the entire crowd of more than 10,000 soldiers lets out a massive cheer. And I get to the end of the chapter, and I say, sir, you want to do another chapter? Mm-hmm. And I get to the end of another. You want to do another? Mm-hmm. And another? Mm-hmm. Instead of 10 minutes, which is what we thought we'd be there for, we were there for an hour. And an hour goes by, I say goodbye to him, I know it's the last time I'm going to see him. But to be able to read to about the first president to, at that point, the oldest living president was humbling. And when he died, what struck me so much is that people used one word over and over in their tributes, which was decency. Mm -hmm. Decency. And yes, it's because he's a decent man, but it's also because I think as a country and a culture, we're starving for decency right now. And I think it's no coincidence that the big movies this past year and biographies were Neil Armstrong, Mr. Rogers, here I am writing about George Washington, everyone, of course, about George H.W. Bush, men of decency, of character, of humility. Right now we pay attention to those in our culture who are good at calling attention to themselves. People on social media, and again, no politics about it, whether you're on Facebook, you're on Twitter, who say, look at me, writing all exclamation points and, and caps. And I'm tired of that. I'm tired of that nonsense. I want to get back to those hard workers, to those people who are humble and who are modest. That is truly what brought this country up and what made us our best. And I think that George Washington is the perfect example of how we get back there. Going back to that humility, to that decency, I was, I was looking at, yeah, you have all these views on these TED Talks that you did. And in one of them, you talk about how when you put your kids to bed at night, <clears throat> there are three things that, and I don't know if you still say this to them. Oh, every night. Do you really? Dream big, work hard, stay humble. If you, if you met my kids right today yeah. and you said, dream big, they would go, work hard, stay humble. I mean, they've heard that. It's ingrained. It is ingrained every single night, even when I left for tour to come here. That's the last thing I said to them. And they're how old now? Uh, my oldest is now 17. I mean, I've been saying this and drilling this into their heads over and over. And, and I stole it from a friend of mine who said that his dad used to say to him every night, dream big, work hard, stay humble. I love that idea. I think it just kind of, it, it's everything that is right uh, in terms of what I wish for my kids. And there's a million things we all wish for our kids, but dream big, work hard, stay humble. Did you have those ideas kind of in your head when you wrote these books, the, the Heroes for My Daughter, Heroes for My Son? We want so much for our kids. We want them to be good people. And I know in that, that book, there are so many instances of all the things yeah. that you want them to emulate. Is that kind of what you had in mind, those yeah. three? Well, and for me, what happened was, is I was just tired of my own kids looking at people who are famous for being famous mm -hmm. and loudmouth athletes and reality TV show stars. And I was just like, there are so many better heroes out there. 
So we started with Heroes My Son and Heroes My Daughter, and then we did the I Am series, right. the Ordinary People Change the World series. And you know, something to me, we started with I'm Amelia Earhart, and did I am Abraham Lincoln. Because if I tell my daughter that Amelia Earhart flew across the Atlantic Ocean, she's not impressed. She's like, big deal that everyone does that. But if I tell her the true story, that Amelia Earhart, when she was seven years old, built a homemade roller coaster in her backyard, right? right? Took a wooden crate, put roller skating wheels on it, shoved it off the roof of a tool shed. My daughter's like, oh my gosh, she's amazing. <laughs> right. And now Amelia Earhart's alive again. She's not some black and white picture in a, in a history book, but she's just like her. She's daring and amazing. And we did I Am Rosa Parks and Albert Einstein. For my son who loves sports, we did I Am Jackie Robinson. And we did I Am Lucille Ball, because I wanted my daughter to have a female entertainment hero who wasn't just famous for being thin and pretty. That Lucy stands for the idea it's not just okay to be different, it's spectacular. We did I Am Helen Keller, put real braille in the book. We can feel the dots and see her name. She says, my, my name is Helen, these dots. What's your name? And something amazing though happened a couple of years ago as the presidential election was approaching between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And, and Hillary and, and Donald Trump are bashing each other's heads open every night on TV. We see it all coming in November. And in that same November, this amazing thing happened. Two of our I Am books started selling more than any others. And they were I Am Martin Luther King Jr. and I Am George Washington. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a Democrat or Republican thing. It was that parents on both sides were tired of turning on the TV and seeing politicians but they wanted to show their kids were leaders. We all know there's a huge difference between a politician and a leader. And I love that people use our books to fight back and build libraries of real heroes for their kids, their grandkids, their nieces, and their nephews. And we've done Neil Armstrong, we've done uh, Jane Goodall, we've even done Jim Henson, um, and Gandhi, and Sacagawea, and Harriet Tubman, and you name it. We're, we're trying to help people build libraries. Wow, so I mean, your kids know that these things were for them. They do. They don't. The thing is, my kids aren't impressed with anything I do, right? <laughs> like one of my kids said to me, my daughter said, she said, I hate to read. And I said, you do know what I do for a living, right? You <laughs> right. understand what feeds you every night. Um, but again, I wasn't impressed with my parents, right? Whatever they did, I was like, that can't be that good. Because it's, you know, it's like if the moment your, your parents like a band that you they like, no longer it's cool. not longer the cool band. Right. So I hope one day they'll realize that writing a book for someone is a, is a fun endeavor. But right now they're like... Dad wrote another savvy book for me, um, but one day, one day I'll make them feel bad. And then the next I Am Kids book that comes out is I Am Billie Jean King. And I love that we got to do Billie Jean King. And one of the things that was great is when we finished the book, we of course sent it to Billie Jean King's office and to her people there to proof it, make sure they were all comfortable with everything we said. And I get a phone call and it says, Billie Jean wants to talk to you. You don't want that call, right? <laughs> Because if I mess up George Washington, what's he going to do, right? right? <laughs> but you mess up Billie Jean King, she's coming to your house with a tennis racket. <laughs> and so she, it was amazing because she, um, she went through two hours I was on the phone with her. So lovely, amazing, and helped us figure out. She's like, see my shoes in this match? I'm like, yeah. She's like, they're not white, they're blue. Like every detail we've got perfect. And at one point I said, she said, the background here, I wasn't in this spot when this thing happened. I was actually here. And I said... Um, I don't mean to be rude, but I got that from your autobiography. And she said, yeah, but I was so busy back then, I didn't proof it. And I love that our children's book is now more <laughs> correct than her own autobiography, oh which gosh. is spectacular to me. Um, so, wow. we, so I Am Billie Jean King comes out in February. And then in November, we're doing uh, the Ordinary People Change the World book series becomes a cartoon show on PBS. And it's called Xavier Riddle and the Secret Museum. It's about a boy named Xavier, his sister, Yadina, and their best friend, Brad. And they go on adventures through time and meet all these amazing heroes and bring back their lessons to today. So, and then after that, I'm gonna take a nap, is what <laughs> it's gonna happen. That's good. <laughs> Coming up, we'll find out what young pre-writer Brad was like growing up, his adventures in getting started in writing, and his experience in writing and working for TV. Plus, Brad will read an excerpt from his book, The First Conspiracy, as Talking With Authors continues in a moment from ATC Media. If you love theater, musicals, and operas, and you like to hear reviews of the more than 150 St. Louis area productions that HEC Media covers each year, make sure you subscribe to Two on the Isle, the podcast. Every two weeks, you'll get to hear the well-crafted takes on all sorts of stage performances by 25-year-plus reviewers, Bob Wilcox and Jerry Kowarski. And you'll get a lesson on how each of the works, old and new, came to be and how they fit in with the stage performances you love. Again, for great theater reviews in St. Louis, subscribe to Two on the Isle, the podcast. 
I have to wonder, you know, we, we talked about your, your kids a little bit ago. As a child, I have to wonder, I mean, because you know, you talk about collecting stories, you like to hunt for signs, secrets, and codes. I mean, as a kid, were you like this inquisitive kid that asked why all the time? I mean, <laughs> did you like, like, treasure hunts yeah, and you know, the Goonies? Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> like, right, it sounds like that. Um, you know, this is, uh, I don't, you, you, this will even make you think I'm crazy or not, but my favorite game when I used to play, when I always loved anything creative, of course. Like, you give me Legos and you leave me alone and I'll be happy forever. I'll make a whole universe and it was, my parents would be like, he could just sit there forever. And I, there was a whole story in my head. It was not just me clicking Legos and oh, action so you figures. Would make up, like, I would make up whole, I'd take action figures and Legos and build whole scenarios. And they, I would watch this universe. No one else could see it, <laughs> but my imaginary friends were always talking to me. But the thing that I think was more telling... for an author, right? That's... For an, the, it's the author side of me. And then the thriller writer, when I, when I used to ride my bike, my favorite game to play was Chase. And I would just imagine someone was chasing me. It's totally a crazy game. I don't know. It makes no logical sense. But I think there was something in my head that just loved that thrill. Um, and it was always a human thrill. It wasn't the, you know, blowing people's heads up and knocking down buildings. That doesn't scare me. What scares me when it comes to telling a good story is those things that could really happen. So what scares me is you go into your bathroom and on the opposite side of a closed shower curtain, you hear a noise. That scares me, which also guarantees that the next time you go into the bathroom, you're gonna think of me. Yeah, <laughs> what a check. All right, you're gonna know you're pulling that curtain aside. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> and one other thing, just I, I, I've read, and, and I know it's been out there, that the first book you wrote had 24 rejection letters, is, is that right? I got 24 rejection letters on my first book. There were only 20 publishers, and I got 24 <laughs> rejection letters, which means some people were writing me twice to make sure I got the point. Um, but I said, if they don't like that book, I'm gonna write another. And if they don't like that, I'm gonna write another. And, and I can tell you, even today, I don't look back on the experience and say, well, I was right and they were wrong and ha ha on them. I look back and realize, whatever it is your dream is, right? Whatever you dream of, don't let anyone tell you no. Don't let anyone tell you no. You gotta find the one person who'll change your life. That's the goal. One person can always change your life. Your job is to find the one person. You, I've, I've seen what said where you, you collect stories and you have these, you've had incredible access to so many amazing places for your thrillers, for nonfiction, for fiction books. Um, it, when you say that you collect stories, do you just put them back in your noggin or do you write them down? How, how do you keep track of all Yeah, of them? I used to keep them in my head and then middle age came and I was like, <laughs> write them down. Um, right. So I do write them down. I mean, I think good stories are everywhere. And the yeah. stories that, you know, I had this story almost a decade ago. And in the beginning, I just, I used it in a novel. I used the plot against Washington in a novel, put it on like a page or a paragraph about five years ago. But I couldn't stop thinking about it. Five years went by, I'm still thinking of this thing. I'd find myself, you know, just checking it out, seeing what it's about. And when five years go by and you have an idea, it means it's time to do the idea. Uh, and that's when you know that it's not just a story that you should have in your head, but it's one you gotta start writing down. I read somewhere that shortly after, you mentioned the 9-11 flag, after that flag was found and that amazing story, I read somewhere that your son's teacher had them write an essay. Oh, yeah, you is saw that, that. Is that right? Is I that true? Let's talk about that. So this was the craziest thing. So we, we helped find the 9-11 flag that the firefighters raised at Ground Zero. It was one of the most amazing moments of my life. We unveiled it in the 9-11 Museum. Crazy amazing. And my son, a couple months ago on 9-11, yeah. uh, comes home with a homework assignment that basically has to, is about the finding of the 9-11 flag. And he has to write an essay on it. And he says to me, ha ha, dad, look, they didn't even mention you in the article. It just says a TV show found it. And, and he just thought it was the greatest that they cut me out. Oh and so, so I put that on social media and you know, it got picked up and people started writing about it. And then the next morning at six o'clock in the morning, I got an email from his teacher who was like, I'm so sorry, I didn't know that was you. And so I of course was like, son, you're gonna crush homework today. Like you're gonna win all homework. And yes, he got a very good grade on his essay. I was like, okay, and tell her I directly said this and here's another quote and here's another one. But it was, it was very fun. That's so funny, she had no idea. No idea, she, it was from, it was like a, I think like a Time Magazine for Kids article and oh, they just, funny. you know, give it to the kids. Oh my gosh, that, when, when you guys, when that happened, when, when it came about that this was, and there was lots of research done and everything to make sure it was the flag, I mean, what was that like for you? I mean, there's still some mystery surrounding how it got to the person, Yeah, so right? what happened was is I went to the History Channel and said I want to make a TV show where we use a show as a wanted poster. 
and tell people about lost historical artifacts, we'll have them bring it back. And I went on the first episode and said, anyone has the 9-11 flag from Ground Zero, we want it back, I'll give you $10,000 if you bring it back. Four days later, a man walked into a fire station in Washington State and said, I saw the show Lost History, this is the 9-11 flag, I wanna return it. Now we spend the better part of a year authenticating it, making sure it's the right one, because uh, did he get the reward? Well, he, oh, I'll tell you, he never took the reward. Oh. Everyone's like, oh, he stole it and then he got the money. Right. No, he, to this day, never took the reward money at oh. all. He thought it was the right thing to bring back. And we worked with the former head of the FBI's art crimes unit to verify and authenticate. And he said to me, Brad, this flag is now more authenticated than most Rembrandts in museums. And I said to him, what's wrong with the Rembrandts in the museums, <laughs> right? You're like, what? But again, to unveil that in the 9-11 Museum where it's currently on display, mm -hmm. and you know, someone sent me a, a photo of a Pearl Harbor veteran saluting it um, to play a small role in that. Again, one of the most rewarding moments of my life. Yeah, because I mean, you, you're from, you're from Brook, Brooklyn, Brooklyn originally? Brooklyn originally, yeah. And I mean, you, you, knew, you knew a flight attendant? Yeah, so what happened was is um, our neighbor, when we were living in Washington, D.C., our neighbor, Michelle Heidenberger, lived across the street from us, and she was one of the flight attendants in the Pentagon flight who was um, killed in the Pentagon flight. And when we were searching for the flag, I went on TV, and I actually added a line to what was written in the script. And I said, I want this back, because I couldn't focus on the 3,000 plus people who died. It was just too big. It was too much of a disaster. But I knew my friend Michelle Heidenberger had died, and I just focused on her. It was for her. And so if you watch the show, I said, I want it back because I want it for my friend Michelle Heidenberger, who we lost in that day. And the amazing part was, is when the flag was finally returned, I said to everyone in the office, I said, can I talk to the guy who brought it back? And they said, sure, and they gave me his number, and I got on the phone with him, and I said, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the American people. We finally authenticated it. This thing's been unveiled. I want to, you know, we went public with it. And I said, I just want to thank you for, for what you did. And he says to me, you want to know why I brought it back? And I said, yeah. And he said, because when I was watching the show, you mentioned your friend Michelle. You know, it really got to me. And I was like, oh, my gosh. That's it. That's the whole reason, right? It's that one person that makes the difference in the whole universe. And that's how I always believe it's my core belief. I believe ordinary people change the world. I don't care where you went to school. I don't care how much money you make. That's nonsense to me. I believe in regular people and their ability to affect change. And right there on that day, it was proven once again right. Did, did it ever come out how he got this flag? Yeah, he was a flag collector. Um, and someone, the way, the story he told us was, is that a woman from 9-11 who lost, I forget if, I, I think lost a loved one, I don't know if it was a brother or a husband, and someone felt bad and said, here, you take this flag. Now, don't forget, when the flag originally uh, was taken down and put up, it wasn't a famous flag. Right. It was a flag. It doesn't become famous until two days later when that picture runs. So everyone's like, oh my gosh, they knew it, they stole it, they, it was a plot. I'm like, how would they know anything? It's just, no one knows any of this is gonna be popular. No one cares. It's only important two days later. Um, and so he, she basically was given it as a, I'm sorry for your loss, and she had it, and, um, and clearly either didn't know what she had or was scared to return it. That's the part we don't know. That's the mystery we don't know is, did she know what she had, did she not? And he was looking for flags. He collects them, asked people, and she gave it to him. I don't know, and I actually don't even remember if he bought it or if it was just given, but that's how he got it, and he saw the, the episode right. and saw the halyard, which is uh, that thing you kind of hoist and clip onto the flag. And that's where we got lucky, is that the halyard matched perfectly. And so he knew, oh my gosh, that's like the one I got. It's such an interesting story. Crazy, crazy story. Yeah, it stood for so much more than just being a flag. It yeah, so no, much. and that's what flags are, right? They, they yeah. don't be, they're not just these things with red, white, and blue on them. They're symbols, and they're symbols of us, right? They're symbols of what we can be and what our dreams are. And rarely do you ever get to interact with something that is uh, the embodiment of that dream. You know, the, the biggest question a lot of people have for you is, What's next? I mean, you, we, we talked about thrillers, nonfiction, children's books. What's next? Yeah, so um, obviously First Conspiracy is out now, and the paperback for The Escape Artist uh, just came out, so I'm working on the sequel to The Escape Artist right now. It's okay. one of my favorite thrillers we've ever done, and people really responded to the characters. I fell in love with the characters, and so I'm working on that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Writer of history, thrillers, television, and children's books, author Brad Meltzer. Now, to close out our podcast, here's Brad reading another excerpt from his book, The First Conspiracy. They are all players 
in an extraordinary plot, a deadly plot against George Washington. Most extraordinary of all, some of the key members of this plot are in George Washington's own inner circle, the very men in whom he has placed his greatest trust. You could call it America's first great conspiracy, but at this moment, America doesn't yet exist. Some of the details of this scheme are still shrouded in mystery, but history provides enough clues for an astonishing story. This is a story of soldiers, spies, traitors, redcoats, turncoats, criminals, prostitutes, politicians, great men, terrible men, and before it's over, the largest public execution at the time ever to take place on North American shores. It all happens amazingly within days of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. That's not all. The discovery of this plot and the effort to investigate it will lead colonial authorities to devise new systems of intelligence gathering and counterespionage. In many ways, this plot against George Washington would lead to the creation of a whole new field of American spycraft, now known as counterintelligence. At its center is a deadly conspiracy against the one man on whose life the very future of America depends. That's number one best-selling author Brad Meltzer reading from his book, The First Conspiracy, The Secret Plot to Kill George Washington, from our interview with him in January of 2019 at Washington University's Olin Library. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Talking with Authors. Remember, you can watch most of the episodes of this program by going online to hecmedia.org. Also, be sure to follow us on social media. Just search for Talking with Authors on all social media platforms. And if you haven't done so yet, please rate and review this program wherever you get your podcasts. The host and editor for the video version of this program was Angie Weidinger. Supervising producer was Julie Winkle. Photography was by Pete Foggy and Ryan Fitzgerald. Graphics were by Greg Kopp. Production support by Jane Ballou and Christina Chastain. ATC Media Executive Director is Dennis Riggs. The Talking With Authors podcast executive producer is Christina Chastain. Podcast editor was Rod Milam, and I'm your podcast host, Rod Milam. Again, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. This is HEC Media. C Media. C Media. C Media.